Welcome to our listeners who are tuning in to The Do Winter Difference, an audio podcast where I spend some time with incredible executives I've worked with and you get to listen in. My hope is that our conversations are unique and insightful, short enough so you won't prefer to respond to texts and emails while listening, but long enough so that you get some great takeaways that you can apply in your own career, life, and relationships. Today, I have the opportunity to speak with Nolan Granberry, Chief Financial Officer at Second Harvest of Silicon Valley. Nolan's career prior to a pivot into nonprofit with Second Harvest was spent in public and private tech companies up and down Silicon Valley. Conversations like this are very easy to have when you go back 20 or more years with someone, especially someone like Nolan. I hope you enjoy our very casual and fun conversation between friends. And Nolan, thanks for spending some time with us. Hey, thanks, Derek. I'm very excited to be here and appreciate you giving me the opportunity to join you. Well, we're getting the better end of the deal. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> Most of the people that are listening to us that live in the Bay Area will have some familiarity with Second Harvest. In fact, Second Harvest is an organization that our firm uh, focuses on donating time and resources to, which we talked a little bit about last year. But I'm guessing not a lot of us know truly how large the organization is, your scope of services, and the mission of Second Harvest. So maybe if we can start the conversation by getting to know a little bit more about, you know, the great place that you work would be awesome. Sure. I'll start, I'll start with our mission. Our mission is that we're looking to end hunger in our communities. Um, so that's, that's the mission. And, and we believe that this is a solvable problem, particularly here in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, where there is a lot of wealth. And I think many people are surprised that there is food insecurity that exists in the Valley. Second Harvest was established in 1974. And yes, this is our 50th year anniversary. And believe it or not, it was started in the garage. Back in the day, there was several resourceful and innovative community members that realized that there were thousands of neighbors going hungry. The local growers in the area were throwing away millions of pounds of fresh fruit and vegetables. And, you know, with the Silicon Valley's innovative nature, these community members found it second harvest. And so 50 years later, we're actually still going strong. We actually are 300 employees and very fortunate to have an awesome volunteer base and volunteers in general. We deliver about 125 million pounds of food every year to 300 age, over 300 agencies, and we serve over 900 distributions through those agencies. I think one thing to point out for, for us is that our focus is delivering healthy food, so you won't find a lot of the snacks and sugary type things as a part of our offering. It's important that we deliver a healthy, healthy supply. And today we're serving one in six or about 500,000 folks a month. Wow. That's incredible. I had no idea it was quite that expansive. And yeah. you partner w with a, a variety of different organizations. How many did you say? Over 300 agencies, uh, and that can be churches, community centers, schools, and all the like. Well, I mean, you had a very successful career in mainstream tech as a CFO and financial executive. So what was the thing that drew you away from that or to Second Harvest? So I'm originally from Ohio, and that's as far as away from tech you can get back 30 years plus, but had an opportunity to come out to San Jose as the uh, tech boom was starting. I was working with in public accounting with Ernst & Young, Arthur Young at the time, but then later merged with Ernst & Winnie and became Ernst & Young. Spent about 11 years in public accounting before moving into the real tech world. Worked with a number of very good tech companies over the years, Ico Systems, Silicon Image, SanDisk. My last job was Natasys, which was a privately held entity with hopes of going public. We were unable to do so. And there came a time when I felt like I needed to think of doing something differently. And being a part of an organization like this was something that I thought of, but didn't know how or where or when I could actually do it, being so busy tied up in the tech world. But as fate may have it, when I was leaving Nanesis, I got a call from a recruiter who talked about Second Harvest. And I came in and met with the CEO and we hit it off real well. And I learned a lot about Second Harvest as a food bank and realized that what I thought was the case where what we would, who, who our main clients were would be those who were destitute, unhoused and down on their luck sort of things and, and came to realize that the majority of our clients are actually 
hardworking Silicon Valley players who, you know, for whatever reason, in, in this expensive environment, just can't always seem to make their ends meet. And, and we're here to serve as a supplement to that. And so my ability to move from the craziness of the tech world into a, into a space where I was actually able to feel like I was giving back to the community was, was a big deal in my making that change. Well, that transition is not easy to make in the Bay Area uh, because it is so expensive in terms of the, the transition into a nonprofit. And I've talked to a lot of people over the years in my career who deliberate about wanting to make that transition into something more philanthropic or nonprofit. And the draw is never monetary, unfortunately, but is rather something that kind of fills a bucket on a more personal level. This may be an unfair question, but do you feel more professionally fulfilled or personally fulfilled going to work every day at Second Harvest than you did before? You know, actually I do. I can remember conversations that I used to have with some of my peers in the tech world. And we always felt like it was great and exciting, the things we were doing in our roles and the companies we were working for. But there did still seem to be that missing thing because we always asked ourselves, how are we actually making a difference? And yes, we might be making a difference in the world of folks making money and what have you, but are we really making a difference? And my opportunity to join Second Harvest was really that true opportunity for me to make a difference. And I, I feel like I actually operate sort of in my role in sort of the back office, so to speak. So I'm not on the front lines all the time, but when I get a chance to go out and actually join the distribution as a volunteer, and get to see the appreciation of the folks coming through and um, receiving food, you know, it's a blessing. And, and I definitely feel very, very good about that. I bet a lot of people might think that a move into nonprofit might mean fewer hours, maybe a little bit less, you know, crazy work at the end of peak cycles. But that, that may or may not be true. And certainly it'll be different for different people. But do you think there are a fair number of similarities at Second Harvest as compared to Silicon Valley? And, and what might surprise somebody who's listening to this is what, what the busiest time of the year is for you and your team. So we're pretty busy pretty much all year round, but it's, it's a different type of busy, I think. Unlike in the tech world or in my, my for-profit world, quarterly results, quarterly performance, and the like was really, you know, the requirement. We're here, it's actually, you know, not so much a requirement from a recordly reporting standpoint, but from a delivery of food to the community and making sure we're able to do that. And that was, a, that was most evident when we hit the pandemic in 2020, where we had to real time shift total gears on how we were operating completely to go from delivering uh, food to about 250,000 individuals to delivering food to 500,000 individuals. And that was in a matter of months. And the logistics behind that, the ability to put systems in place behind that was an amazing effort by the organization and the team. But I think it would rival almost any for-profit business relative to some of the complexities and dynamics that you need to face to, to make something like that happen. So that's, we're now going back four or five years, I suppose. And you talked about serving 250,000. Now you are routinely servicing 500,000. There has not been a drop off in need at all you know, since the pandemic. That is the one, if there's, if there's a message that I can deliver today is that, yes, we have actually seen, we have been, we have been the beneficiary of a very, very generous community, particularly during the pandemic years where we had, there was a lot of money raised in support of the pandemic effort. And, and that just sort of you know, dwindled off to some degree, but we have not seen the need decrease. There was a small ebb, you know, in early 2022, late 23, but then as the government support ended and the dynamics of the interest rate economic, um, and the changes in the economy impacted folks, we are back at our peak pandemic levels and we are we're in need of folks to you know continue to understand that that's where we are at and provide enough support whether it's through volunteering efforts or through donations in support of the fact that we are actually we actually still see the same you know number of folks that we were seeing back at the peak pandemic would it be fair to say that you know, if you have limitations in terms of your ability to serve it is 
monetary donations um, or donations of any sort? Well, I guess monetary donations so you can acquire more resources to be able to deliver, or is it people and volunteer resources or a variety of different levers? Yes. Truth is both are important. If you think the amount of, think of the amount of volunteers that we utilize in any year, uh, I believe last year we had over 40,000 volunteers um, provide over 200 and I want to say 50 or 60,000 hours of uh, volunteer services. It's almost doubling our entire team of well, the 300 I mentioned earlier that we have in support of our organization. But having the donations, the funding is actually very critical to us. And we feel that through our buying power and the relationships we have, um, we're actually able to uh, make the most of every dollar that we receive. Um, probably much more than, I wouldn't say probably for sure, much more than any individual who could go to a Safeway or Albertsons or wherever and buy it and actually bring that food to the organization. We, we Like I said, we're serving one in six and um, we actually say a dollar will allow for us to serve, I think it's one or two meals we can create it where it can serve at least one or two meals for, for anyone. With regard to donations and corporations leaning in and, and that topic of conversation, I've read a lot of articles lately about corporate ESG initiatives and many really very frustrating to me at a personal level because as there appears to be a, an increasing amount of backlash for you know, ESG initiatives and sponsorship, which include monetary donations and community programs that benefit you know, nonprofits like Second Harvest. And it should be noted too that most of the things that I've read that take a negative take on ESG have come from policymakers and political candidates versus employees. And now you've spent time as an executive in for-profit companies and now a nonprofit. Do you think there is or should be an implicit obligation for companies to give back to organizations, organizations like Second Harvest? You know, Derek, and no. This is, this is an area that I think that when I look at folks that step up with us, for us, and do things, and we have a lot of companies that do a lot of good with us, and whether they're donating money, whether they're actually, I mean, we have so many companies that actually put together teams to volunteer, that come out to volunteer with us, and that, that is very, 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 very helpful for us. So when I, when I look at that, the focus on how folks are, I tend to focus on that being that there are a number of good players and we continue to try to, you know, reach people and, and see how much more we can expand that. And so that, that's, that's how I sort of view, view it. More of a glass half full perspective instead of my negative perspective. Like, yeah, yeah. why can't there be more? To, and so yeah, like, we're well, happy with what we can get. We are always striving to push, push for more, for sure. It actually is you know, critical, you know, continue. Like I said, 500,000 folks a, a month shouldn't, shouldn't be the case in the Bay Area if you, if you think about it, right? And so for everyone that actually is helping out, big kudos, and, and we want to try to give kudos to even more. Well, and 500,000 is those who you and the organizations that you work with touch. There are many more thousands that may not even have access to those organizations yeah. or you to be able to get access to food as well. So, you know, in terms of a total addressable market. It's, I'm sure, significantly larger than that, unfortunately. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously successful career over the course of the past um, 20 plus years. What would you be doing if you weren't a CFO? Derek, I'm a sports nut. I played basketball in college. Division three, though. Can't say I was a D1 player, but Division three, but that was a great experience for me. And I think the idea of sports for youth is a very important dynamic that I think all should share in because it builds so many life lessons. And so if I had my, my druthers of having something else other than being a CFO, it would be coaching probably basketball in some, some form or fashion, whether it's youth basketball or high school, high school, or, or I would even love to get to a college level, but that would, that would have been where I, I think I would have been focused on. Those, that, those are long roads to travel, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Well, you, you know, you, you got time. You got time. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> well, instead of being on the receiving end of so many of these questions, we get to turn the tables and you get to ask me an unscripted question that I don't know anything about. So you okay. shoot and I will try to respond as best I can. I actually have two, if that's okay. Both of them are pretty yeah. easy or pretty straight. Uh, could be pretty straightforward. I think you've been quite successful and I... 
I have enjoyed the many, many years that we've had in, in our relationship. So I would be curious as to you, what would you be doing if you hadn't brought up, you know, becoming a great recruiting, the firm that you did, the recruiting firm you did and, and the things that you're doing now, what would you be doing differently? You know, I have a real passion for cooking. Ah. I think like it's probably not something people would have thought that I would say, but I love cooking. I love the kitchen. I love the intricacies of meal preparing. And, and I also like the fact that, you know, preparing a meal is that you can share with others as a way of kind of bringing people together. I think it's a, it's kind of my, my wife calls it my love language. Like I love cooking yeah. for people and making things. And it just, I mean, from the moment I think up, oh, I got to go to the store and like the things I'm going to get, like it gets me excited. So I, I could see myself doing that, although fully recognizing that that is a very difficult lifestyle. And, yeah. but the practical side of me, which it probably did, would have said, no, you, yeah, maybe you should do something that is, <laughs> is, that is easier because that is a, that is a tough job, but a very, something that I think I would have absolutely loved doing. Ah, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Maybe I can get to taste one of your meals one day. One of these days, <laughs> buddy. One of these days. The other quick question, there's a big game coming up in a week. And I was just curious, do you think the Niners can get to their sixth Super Bowl? So by the time this is published, I will, will have known what the answer is. I cannot help but, you know, uh, be a homer on this one. And I know that the whole world's talking about Mahomes is unbeatable. And by all accounts, it cert certainly seems to be. But I don't know. I just I can't help but think the Niners, Niners are going to pull this one out. and not with great difficulty, like, which is oh. like really putting my neck out there. Nice. I really, I, I really think they've got this one. So fingers crossed. And it, if it could be wrapped up with a, an MVP for Purdy, I think that would just drive people crazy. But I think that'd be pretty fun. And you? I, I'm, I just really like a good game. I'm a big Steeler fan. My, my oldest son is a Niner fan. So I have my heart in leading to him to, so he can get a victory. And I love Mahomes, so it's a tough one for me with all those three um, considerations. I'd love to see a great game, but it'd be great if the Niners could pull pull it out and get number six. Well, you end up at a party and someone's putting squares up. Hopefully, you land on you know the seven and the four, whatever you have picked for the quarter, and there you, you can go. have a great game and maybe walk away with a, a couple bucks. Well, you Nolan, you you, you you and a great team of executives, leaders, and team are doing awesome things. The second harvest. What can listeners do if they want to get involved or have their organizations involved? And I will say to folks who are listening, yes. we will have contact information for you to be able to get your groups together, to be able to volunteer. I have volunteered numerous times. It is really hard to do. It is work that seems like it could go on forever. When your shift is done, yeah, the work is not done yeah. ever. I've never done a shift where I've thought, oh, and we're good. Like there's always more to do. So I cannot, you know, uh, I cannot say uh, more strongly than, than this. Please, please, if you can find time to donate, it is an incredibly great experience. But what are there? Are there folks that they should contact, Nolan? Um, really, it's, it's as simple as going to www.shfb.org. And on there, it's very simple. There's, there's buttons, there are two buttons to push, or one that says donate, and one that says volunteer. You click on those and it's just very straightforward to actually accept the donation and, and deliver a donation. And also if you click on the volunteer side, it is uh, very easy to uh, pick a spot, pick a time, uh, whether you're going out to a distribution or whether you're actually participating in a sort. And again, that's www.shfb.org. And, uh, and I just like to say, you know, we're back at peak levels and really should not have food insecurities in the Valley. It's a solvable problem and any, everyone can make a difference. So donating time and money is very, very much appreciated. Well, and on that note, I'll make a transition. I'll say thank you for donating your time to me, my friend. I hope that we run into one another again real soon. I'll be intentional yes. about that after this yes. conversation. And yes. to everybody out there, you know, take it upon yourself. Lean in and, and help if you can, please. Thanks, Thanks Nolan. Appreciate it. it. Take care. Enjoy it. Thank Bye. you. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the Do Winner Difference podcast. If you like this episode, head to dewintergroup.com backslash dewinter hyphen difference to catch future episodes and share your thoughts, comments, or suggestions. And make sure to connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is produced by the Dewinter Group 
the leading recruiting firm in the Bay Area and beyond. We help top companies and people reach their fullest potential through world-class accounting, finance, and technology recruiting services. 